everyone, it's Victoria for Slurp Vision. We're here in the Slurp Warehouses today and I'm joined by David Powell, founder and winemaker of Torbrek. So very excited to have you here today. Thanks for having me. And we're actually going to be tasting some very nice treats. So the Lair, the Runrig and the whole range really. So I'm very excited. Um, before we get started, maybe I can ask you some questions. Sure. So Dave, you've come a long way, but for those that aren't familiar with Torbrek, could you tell us where in Australia you're coming from? Sure. Torbrek is in the uh, Barossa Valley in South Australia, which is 50 miles northeast of my hometown of Adelaide. Mm -hmm. It's one of the older wine-growing regions in Australia, and it's a very special place because when Phylloxera got to the east coast of Australia, as it did in a lot of other parts of the world, it never got to the Barossa. So. Okay. Quite surprisingly, even though we're in the new world, we actually have some of the oldest, oldest vineyards anywhere and probably the longest unbroken bit of cultural heritage. It's just a very um, special circumstance which gives me the ability to make the wines that I do. Very good. And what are the grape varieties that you're working with? Well, predominantly red. Uh, Bross is warm and dry, so maintaining natural acidity in whites is pretty hard. Mm -hmm. We make a little bit of white. We make a, a semillon, which is a very unusual kind of semillon. It's a very good semillon. Thank you. It came to Australia, this particular clone from the island of Madeira, so it actually makes um, full body wine, but you can get some acid natural acidity and minerality that you don't normally see from Semillon in a warmer climate. Mm. And then we also make a little bit of Yonne Marsan and Roussan, but predominantly I work with uh, Shiraz, Grenache, and what Australians call Mataro, of course, right. Vedra, Monastral is the true name. Okay. So they're the three. I don't work with Pinot Noir, I don't work with even Cabernet Sauvignon, not that I don't like them, I yeah, just, just don't think them across yeah. I think you need to work with varieties that actually can give you a sense of place, and yeah. our climate does unfortunately mean that we're having to work with more full-bodied varieties and thicker skin varieties. Mm. Uh, how did you get into winemaking? Um, well, by accident almost. I actually studied economics at university. My wow. father's a chartered accountant and I was supposed to follow him to the family firm and it sounded a bit like a pre-arranged marriage to me. So <laughs> I, I literally ran away to the wine business instead. Right. Worked uh, for your lumber up in the Brossa and then okay. headed to California and then back to Australia and then ended up working in Spain and then Italy and then a lot of time in France and particularly in France in the Rhone Valley that really it's where I, if you like my, I consider it my philosophical home when it comes mm -hmm. to winemaking. France. Yeah. Oh, the Rhone Valley in France. Right, Rome. Because yeah. it's interesting, I mean, you're, you're coming from the New World, but your wines have a, a real kind of longevity to them, and you can really age them. And is that kind of an old world approach to a new world? Yeah, future? I mean, I, I make Australian wine, there's no doubt about it. I don't make any excuses, because I think Australia has some of the greatest wine in the world. Yeah. So I'm not for a minute trying to make um, Northern Hemisphere wines, but I would certainly have to admit that I'm very strongly influenced by what I learnt when I was working in, and particularly in, in the Rhone Valley in France, and you know, giving the wines a sense of place, not trying to overdo them. In the Brossa Valley, you're always going to make big, rich wines. The trick is not to make them too big and rich, mm -hmm. and maintain some finesse and some elegance and minerality that that is um, not always what people expect out of Australia. The Laird is the most expensive wine in Australia. Yeah, th that's that no coincidence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it received 100 points from Robert Parker. The first one did, yes. Right, we haven't had this one yet. The 2005. So um, what does that mean for you to get 100 points from Robert Parker as a winemaker? Um, well, it's actually the second time he's given me 100 points, but it's fantastic because if you look at the scores Parker gives, over the 30 years, there haven't been that many. Mm -hmm. um, so it really puts you into another league when you're you know, considered a 100-point yeah. winery. So it has, I think, elevated Torbrick. And consider Torbrick 16 years young, and I mean that yeah. quite seriously. That's young in the wine Absolutely, business. yeah. It's not generations what, and generations. Once again, working. though, that, that doesn't necessarily come from me. That comes from the, the, the fruit that I work with. And that's, mm. I mean, that's why I went back to the Brosser. It's not because it's 50 miles from my hometown. It's because that's where I wanted to mm. live and work because of the vineyards that were there. But, yes, to get 100 points in a short amount of time is... is, is um, very satisfying, you know what I mean, and it, 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 it helps, it really gets, uh, you know, whether people love or hate Robert Parker, I'm actually, you know, can have a lot of time for him and consider him a friend, but at the mm -hmm. same time, it's, uh, you know, he's got a lot of power, and so that really does um, make people pay yeah. attention to what you're doing, and as I said, because he hasn't done it that often, it's not something that he, he doesn't throw around 100 points a lot, so. No. Is there a pressure for the next vintage? I mean, how do you think the 2006 compares? He hasn't scored this yet. What do you anticipate? Uh, I try not to second guess what's going to happen with the scores of wine. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, with, from a winemaking point of view, you look at a wine not just as a snapshot of what it's doing now, but where it's going to go. And I think uh, sometimes with the press, because it's more um, something that's happening now, their scores are probably more related to how the wine shows in the glass today rather than just about how, where it'll go in 5, 10, 15 years' time. The 06 was a slightly cooler year. I think the 06 has more elegance, it has more finesse. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'll be longer lived, of course. I'll probably be dead by the time I find out whether I'm right or not. So, um, but in saying that, I, I, you know, I, it, it'll be up there. But I really yeah. just don't want to speculate. Yeah, yeah. Every time I've done that years ago, I've you know, got it wrong. So. Right. Well, 
we'll see. I suppose the, the, the interesting thing is look at the run rig, for example, over 10 years, the average score is 98 and a half, so really, you know, well, there some years it's 97 and a half, and yeah. some years, you know, the 03 got a re scored to 100, so it's really always up in that ballpark. So what are we tasting today, Dad? Today we're going to taste uh, five of my wines. We'll start with the 2008 Steading, then we'll have the 2007 Factor, the 2007 Descendant, and the 2007 Run Rig. And last, but by no means least, the 2006 footage of the Laird. The Laird, perfect. So please click through each of the bottles that you see for an individual tasting note by Dave Powell and myself.